Welcome to another episode of Off the Plugin Chain. I'm your host, Dr. Tom. In today's video, we're going to break down a fantasy queue. We're going to look at a queue by developer CineTools. They've got sound design queue packs designed for movie trailers and promos. This one is called Fantasia. It's designed for fantasy, epic, adventure, mystery, and drama scores, films, and commercials. We take a look at their promo material here. You get five fantasy cues that are for cinematic trailers. You, they're in 24-bit, 96 kilohertz format. All tracks are BPM and key labeled, so that makes using them really easy. They're perfect for use in cinematic composition, film scores, short movie scores, trailers, commercials. They've got a whole gamut of stuff here. What you have to make sure you, you make note of, though, is that the stems and tracks in these trailer queue series, they cannot be used to create tracks for library music companies. So I, I went over a queue by another one of their packs called Frightmare, which is designed for horror movies and scores. And um, we talked briefly about this in, in that video, but you certainly couldn't use these for library music companies because you would be misrepresenting them as your own work. So essentially it'd be like you were plagiarizing. So if you're going to use these cues, I mean, you're, you've got the ability to do that. The, um, the license grants you that. You can use them in commercial uh, projects. You just can't send them to a, a library music company. I would be careful though using these. Um, you'd have to make sure that they're kind of embedded in the whole texture of your project. So what I like to do is I, I look at these to try to determine or try to break down what these cues are all about. Here's some examples. We're, we're using Studio One today and we've got um, at the top there's a cue we're going to look at called floating and then we've got two stems one called atmospheres and one called boom hits and then I've got five tracks here I want to go through briefly they're designed to be kind of like EDM build-ups and um, I'm not an EDM producer I think if you look at EDM music and you look at trailers there's actually some similarities which is kind of fascinating so we're gonna we're gonna delve into that Let's take a look at listen to this uh, the full mix here, and the full mix would run about three minutes, but um, we're going to listen to about the first thirty bars, and then it's just going to cut off. So let's listen to that, and then um, I want to play through it one more time, and I'll we'll talk. But this first time, we're just going to listen to it with without me talking. Okay, so that was the uh, that was the uh, portion of the full mix, and now I'd like to play through it, and I'm going to um, provide a little bit of commentary. So when the cue starts, you hear these low bo low boom hits, and then you hear a pad, kind of a mid range pad. Here comes a hit again. They're kind of in equal intervals. You hear this kind of gritty sound effect, and now you're hearing a high string sound more of the booms periodically and then there's going to be a break here okay and then you kind of have a whoosh uh, bringing you into that uh, that that measure there now you're hearing kind of an ambient guitar and there's a cinematic piano line up above although it's it's not very loud more whooshes and hits Okay, so we don't have to listen to the whole thing through again, but 
uh, just kind of wanted to mention a few things. So essentially what you're doing is you're, you're creating a, a texture here. So you're starting off with these booms and that kind of sets the stage, kind of building tension and the the booms are followed by the mid-range pad and then you start hearing the the gritty kind of glitchy uh, sound effects and then you hear the high strings and that's pretty much uh, what you hear through the first part of the cue before you get to that break then there's a, a short break there where there's no sound but it's almost like the the music is sort of hovering there you're kind of waiting in anticipation what's going to happen next and then in the next section you start hearing a little bit uh, I think what a lot of people would call ambient guitar and then also cinematic piano and the ambient guitar it's kind of in a high range uh, a higher treble part of the the guitar range uh, a lot of times it sounds a little bit more distant um, uh, music creators might put convolution reverb on it or some kind of effect to make it seem like it's it's distant. You can also um, work with miking on some of your uh, virtual instruments to get that effect that something's far away. So then you, you hear that ambient guitar and then you hear the cinematic piano. And the cinematic piano I think is kind of interesting because I've been a pianist uh, or I've played piano since about 12 years old. And clearly, there's just so many things you can do on the piano. Um, just, it's possible you could play 10 notes at once. But with cinematic piano, pretty much what you hear is just the right hand or the high treble line by itself. And for whatever reason, stylistically, that's become known as a cinematic piano. So it's kind of like uh, composers are using the the high treble line as kind of or the piano is just kind of like a single line instrument like a flute or a clarinet or something like that so I, I find it fascinating because a lot of times with so-called cinematic piano uh, you don't really hear much in the way of uh, accompaniment with it as far as the piano itself you don't hear much in the bass or um, any kind of chordal structure um, usually it's just a single line high piano by itself there's also kind of a range there where if, if uh, you look on a piano, middle C is C4, and if you go up an octave, then that would be C5. And so I, I think what you see with the cinematic piano, the range goes roughly about C5 to C6 or maybe G6. So it's the octave starting an octave above middle C, extending maybe an octave to an octave and a fifth above uh, that note. And that's kind of sort of the uh, cinematic piano range. Um, obviously, there's differences in different cues, and you know, uh, different uh, composers will um, you know draw upon whatever they need at, at a given time, so they wouldn't necessarily have to stay in that range. But typically, I think you'd find that cinematic piano is in that range, about C5 to G6. Now, uh, you can obviously go above G6, but once you get above that range, the uh, the notes start to sound a little thinner, a little more penetrating, but it's a little bit thinner. So um, it, it does seem to kind of work out like it's an optimal uh, range for cinematic piano. Okay, so that said, uh, if we take a look at the next, the next track here, this is actually, um, these next two are actually stems. So the uh, the second track here is the atmospheres and this one you're going to hear the the string uh, the mid-range string pad the glitchy sound effects and then the high string note so there you got the pad and the glitchy sounds okay and now the high string sound high violins come in okay and so I would say um, in a rough sense that uh, that same range for cinematic piano seems to work for uh, this single um, long sustained violin sound that you hear in so much uh, film music this has been a technique that's been used for decades really and you can use it in just nearly any any uh, film genre. 
uh, it, it kind of, it builds anticipation. It seems to sort of fill in the texture a little bit. But um, what I find interesting about it is that if you were to drop that high string sound down just one octave, it would definitely change the way you, you hear it all. So there's something about that, that high string just all by itself, how it contributes to the texture of the, of the music. Now if we listen to the, the next track, this is uh, called Boom Hits, and this is just the, the low boomy hits that you hear at different intervals throughout this cue. It starts off with a, a boom. Now here comes another one. So they're pretty much equally spaced, at least throughout the beginning of the cue. And what you find with some of these effects is that, you know, you can space them intervally or at equal intervals like this and you know it's very satisfying uh, what you need to be careful though is to just always repeat it in the, at the same interval after a while uh, you can sort of get grow tired of it um, at, at the beginning it's kind of novel it builds the uh, the texture it builds anticipation that something's going to happen but a lot of times what happens in in these cues is that you start off uh, these these hits these uh, booms are are spaced apart and then the the cue starts to grow with uh, you know fervor and and, and um, speed perhaps and uh, um, you, you grow a kind of um, anxious what's going to happen next and um, then the booms can happen uh, more frequently and um, uh, just kind of get into sort of a crescendo but like I said you have to be careful about how often you're playing some of these things over and over. Now, one thing that you notice with the, this trailer cue is that at one point, let me scroll through here, there's this, there's this break here. And this is a very common thing that you see or hear in a lot of trailers. Uh, it can happen a couple times in a trailer. Um, it sort of is a way of... Uh, it's part of the form in a way, and it sort of uh, provides a, a sort of like a boundary for different sections of the trailer. Typically, though, if there's only one, it'll happen near the end, and um, it's sort of like the, the music sort of hovers there. It creates this sort of feeling like what's going to happen next. That's followed by sort of like a, a, a whoosh or a riser that goes straight into the next section um, uh, you know, it terminates at the end of the measure, so you get the you know full effect of the downbeat, and then you're off to the races with the end of the trailer. So it it is very effective. I'm not sure I would have come up with that kind of form on my own, uh, but you, you hear that uh, in so many trailers over and over. And what I've um, noticed is that if you listen to EDM music at all. Uh, EDM has um, sections called build-ups and then there's drops and sometimes there's a, there's a break before the build-up where there's um, no music at all and it's very effective it's it's really interesting how effective that is when the music just stops for a, a beat or two um, sometimes it might be a measure but sometimes it's only a couple beats and then you go into the the build-up and then there's there's the drop and so what I want to do is, is go through these five examples here. And here's the first one. Okay, so what you had was kind of like the uh, syncopated drum line and then it goes straight into kind of straight rhythm and then uh, you've got this synthy build up part and then the drop okay now if we listen to the second example uh, let's see how that sounds okay and so that thing that's the kind of thing that you hear uh, very often in, in uh, EDM. So you've got the the drum loop and then there's a, a, a bar or two where it goes into a really fast uh, snare drum rhythm 
and then that can be uh, followed by uh, another buildup, which is more synthy, and then you got the drop. So you see that um, acceleration of the snare, uh, just building the tension, going right into the buildup, and then that's followed by the drop. And this is kind of music where you're not going to be worrying about changing your time signatures or doing anything kind of artsy like that. It's dance music, so it's got to be predictable. You're going to dance to it. And as a result, most of this music's more or less in four. Let's take a listen to the third track here. And... Okay, so there the buildup was, was a couple bars, and it's very effective. It just really ramps up, and then it ends right at the end of the measure followed by the drop on the downbeat. So that's very effective in, in how, um, uh, how that affects people. Uh, it's uh, very impactful. Um, now the next two are, are examples of EDM uh, buildups that I think sort of resemble what happens in a, in a trailer. So there's a break. And it's just fascinating how that, that gap in time there just does something where you've got this, this sort of uh, accelerating uh, uh, drum line. Oftentimes it's a real quick snare pattern, but um, in this case uh, it wasn't exactly that. But then there's a, uh, a short gap where there's no sound, followed by the buildup and then the drop. And so it's, it's a very effective uh, type of thing. It's, it's very much uh, part of the EDM form, although from piece to piece, uh, EDM piece to uh, another EDM piece um, or song, uh, there's similarities, but it's, it's a very interesting art form that not, or you can compare two EDM pieces to trance pieces, and uh, they're going to have different sounds, um, different different um, aspects of the form are they're not going to necessarily use like a cookie cutter a b a b a b a form so uh here's here's another example the last one here and it's very similar to the last one we can probably play these back to back and you can get a sense of just uh how a little bit more uh break uh adds to the the excitement and the the impact of this. Okay, so if we go back to the one before it and let's let's start let's start uh, a little, we don't need to listen to the whole thing through again, but here it is with um, not as much of a break. It sort of rounds out this this uh, uh, percussion unit here, or figure. And I think that's pretty effective. I mean, I'm not a you know EDM producer, so you know um, I'm not going to say this is definitively representative of EDM. I just try to put this together so you can see how. A break in EDM songs is very similar, I think, uh, the same type of effect that you get when you're listening to a trailer, and then there's a break, and then there's the, the you know, the, the finale of the, the cue or the trailer, you know, takes you to the end. So here's the, um, well, the last cue again, where um, it cuts off a little sooner doesn't round off that that last drum figure it might be a little better if we build up to that just a little bit more so let's try this one more time so in some ways I like the seventh track better in some ways I like the eighth track better and I think what it shows is that you know based on 
whatever you're doing, you know, it might call for a little bit more space. It might call for uh, less space. It might call for a, a two bar riser. It might call, or it might seem like uh, that real quick snare uh, figure followed by the build up is, is a better way to approach it. Uh, so it, it just depends on what you're going for. And then, you know, you probably want to mix things up so you don't always do everything the same. So here it is again. Okay, one more time. So that's subtle. It's, it's very subtle how it just rounds out that last uh, percussive figure. So anyways, um, I think what, what you want to do when you're looking at these cues is people talk about layering, but I think what's important is not just to layer, but to understand what you're doing. You're creating a texture and that texture might start with a boom and then it follows with uh, a mid-range pad and then you get gritty sound effects and then you get the high string line up above and that creates kind of like a unit and you know um, you you keep sort of playing through this whole unit almost like it's a theme but it, it's, it's not it's more it's you're building a texture and you're building it from the ground up which is where the, the layering comes in and by layering it also creates some anticipation it follows a very predictable meter and so these effects like the the risers the whooshes the build-ups it's very predictable where they happen and they they terminate at the end of a measure followed by a very clear downbeat and so um, this is not the kind of music I mean you can explore and try different things obviously but I would think overall you're gonna find that you need to stick with the meter very solid in this kind of music to get the kind of effect that you're looking for anyways I think that's uh, all I want to talk about today uh, next time Maybe we'll look at some more cues, and I also want to prepare a few videos where I talk about uh, the process of uh, creativity. So I teach a creativity class um, uh, every so often, um, in addition to psychology and music, and so I would like to talk a little bit about creativity in some coming videos. That's all we're going to do today, so appreciate everybody for tuning in, and as always, stay safe, be well and keep being creative.